uh, cover crops and how we can incorporate cover crops into beef forage systems, keeping in mind, of course, that uh, you know, primarily uh, these are going to have to be integrated into current cropping systems and those types of things. But you know, as we move forward, guys with cows in this part of the country, you know, they aren't making a heck of a lot more pasture. Uh, and so it's these types of systems are, are what's going to keep the cows in the country because this is primarily where a lot of the the forage, you know, after the grass runs out is going to be is, you know, cover crops and other types of forages uh, that can fit in these little niches here, there, and everywhere uh, and, and do it at a pretty reasonable cost. And so let's just t start out with a little bit of a of, of background on what cover crops are, what they're typically used for, and then we'll talk about how to incorporate them into a system. So uh, if you go back, you know, primarily these things, uh, uh, you know, cover crops obviously are nothing new. Most of you probably remember green cover, green chop, green this and that. And the other. It's the same concept. Probably the big difference is the types of species that are available now. Uh, and primarily these brassica type species like the turnips and the radishes and those types of things. When, when these st first started getting really popular, you know, probably about 10 years ago now, uh, you know, they were telling me about using turnips and radishes to break up soil compaction. And when they said radishes, I was thinking like table radishes. And I was like, I don't think that's going to get the job done. Uh, but then I realized, you know, they showed me that there are other types of radishes that grow these huge tubers. Uh, and those obviously would be fairly uh, uh, effective at breaking up hard pan and those types of things. And of course, primarily this started out a little further west. You know, most of the initial cover crop stuff was done out in central South Dakota around Pier. Uh, you know, obviously because of the hard pan soils and those types of things. And they've gradually worked their way east as we found more uses for them. They can do more things for us. And of course, more species are available that can meet some of the things that we want to do. So you can see here, I mean, this thing's over a foot long right here. And we broke it off getting it out of the ground. Okay, so you know what these things do is they go down and they just find a little, they hit that hard pan and they find a little crack. And so they might be that big around at the top and then where they work their way through that crack they might be about that big around and then they'll be that big around under the hard pan again. And so you can imagine how that improves infiltration uh, and just changes the whole system uh, over time. Uh, you know, probably not a big concern in this country, but you know, a lot of folks use cover crops to try and improve soil organic matter, improve fertility, uh, recapture nitrogen, different things like that. Adding nitrogen to the soil in some systems is important. If you look at things like vetches, for no bigger than the plant is, it produces an inordinate amount of nitrogen in a very short amount of time. And that's very attractive to some folks to be able to do that. Uh, obviously, soil erosion is always a concern, just keeping some green cover over the top. You know, out west, it's more wind erosion. Here, it's more water erosion. But just having some type of cover over the soil uh, is going to be pretty critical for some folks. Uh, again, managing soil moisture is going to be important. You know, of course, that relates back to organic matter. It relates back to keeping the soil surface covered those types of things. Grazing is something that has probably come on a little bit more recently, primarily because of the time of year that we can get these things to grow. And if you know what you're doing, it can be really, really, really cheap roughage. And so there's a lot of opportunity, can be a lot of opportunities for grazing if that's what you want to do. Probably most recently what I've seen folks doing is uh, seeding these cover crops into a standing crop and they don't expect a heck of a lot of growth out of them but when they go and graze stalks you've got a little bit of green material there to provide protein. And that may, for some folks, that may reduce the amount of commercial supplements that they need to run in that type of system.
So lots of different things you can do, okay? And like I kind of said on the, at, the, at the top of the deal here, you know, one of the big things from a grazing perspective and a cow perspective that is pushing this is if you belong to the out of grass land and cattle company, these fit a very nice niche, mostly uh, early in the year or in the fall, early winter, when grass isn't available, we can stretch those, that grazing capacity out a little bit uh, and do some of those things. So, what cover crops are available? The list, literally, there's thousands of species. I've just kind of boiled it down here to probably some of the more common things that are used. Uh, believe me, there you can have as many species as you <coughs> desire. You can spend as much money as you, can, as you desire. Most of that's not necessary, so that's kind of why it's useful to know a little bit about what some of these things can do for you. The biggest term to be familiar with in the cover crop deal is brassicas. So those are going, that's a family of plants that includes the turnip, the radish, uh, you know, Winfred, which is kind of a turnip type plant, uh, canola, winter peas, rapeseed, on and on and on and on and on. Uh, when you think about, you know, the old green chop or green cover days, cereals were very popular. They still are, the wheats, the rye, so on and so forth, both spring and winter, depending on what type of system you're trying to run, what, what you want to do. Um, legumes, we talked a little bit about that. The big one are these vetches. Hairy vetch is probably the most common used because of the, it's an annual and it produces a tremendous amount of nitrogen in a very short amount of time. Uh, some of these other vetches, they, they do produce a lot of nitrogen, but they tend to grow a little bit slower. Uh, the clovers, burnet, which is another annual clover, those types of things are generally popular largely because of price. The seed is relatively cheap, so people use them uh, because it's available and it's cheap. And so that's a little bit when you get into these long lists of species, you kind of have to be aware of, well, okay, that's fine, but what's available and how much does it cost? I mean, they, there's cover crops that are advertised I mean, you and I have never even knew a plant like that existed, and it's largely because you can't really get seed for it, and if you can, it's really expensive and those types of things, but it is technically available. Uh, summer annuals, uh, most of you, are, you're gonna be familiar with the sorghums, the millets, the sedan grass, the hybrids, those types of things. Um, probably not as common in this country down here, uh, but they are available and they are oftentimes used in cover crop type mixes depending on the situation. And then the annual grasses like rye grass, Italian rye grass, which is a winter annual, and tep grass. Um, and most of you probably have at least heard of tep grass. It's a warm season annual uh, grass. So, you know, a tremendous number of cover crops species that are available, but how do you look at a list like that and figure out, well, you know, what are these things going to do for me? Okay, so I kind of laid out four primary things you need to think about uh, if you're going to try and do a, a, a cover crop type deal to provide, to produce some extra forage. Okay, number one is cost, which we'll talk about that uh, as we go along. The second thing is cattle performance, because folks can get a little disillusioned with from a cattle performance standpoint, what cover crops can really do for you. Because what you see in the literature, like you know, the popular press type things, doesn't always match up with what really happens in reality. Okay, and so we'll talk about that just a little bit. In this country, obviously cold tolerance is gonna be really important. Okay, because most of these crops, these cover crops are gonna go in after some type of uh, annual cash crop and that's usually going to be towards the end of the year. We're going to want to use them towards the end of the year, and so it's going to be cold out, obviously, when we need these things to be available. And then the fourth thing that the, uh, the rookies run into uh, is residue management, um, because depending on what you're using these crops for, you know, if you're mechanically harvesting them, that's one thing, but if you're grazing them, we oftentimes think that grazing will completely remove all of the material that 
the crop grows and you know that that's not always the case. Depending on what the crop is, there can be a tremendous amount of residue left over. But you're going to have to deal with it at some point when the next cash crop goes in. And so we want to kind of know that on the front end, what kind of residue are we going to be dealing with uh, and how effectively are livestock going to remove that if that's what we're going to do. Are you taking questions now or you want to save them for the end? Go ahead. I got a thing about residue. Yeah. And one of the biggest challenges on cover crops is that they eat too much. We need to keep the ground covered. So if you go into a straight brassica or something like that and they leave that ground black, they didn't do you any favors. So, no, that's right. So uh, the lack of residue after grazing is also something that you would you would want to manage. And I think the mix would probably include something that they don't want to eat. Exactly. So keep that ground covered. That's exactly right, because you do run into that. Species selection becomes very important, so knowing what you want the thing to do up front is going to have a big impact on what types of species you use for that very reason. Another thing, too, that the guys need to think about this time of year with doing that is the herbicides you're going to use. Bingo. Because we, we, the first year I did that, a lot of turnips and stuff, when you go behind corn silage, you know, you're going to have a hard time. So you got to, you want to be thinking now while you're doing your herbicide right. management because you're going to have to go through the labels. And a lot of them have grazing restrictions. Yes, that's do. correct. And the other thing you'll run into is uh, in some crop rotation systems, a lot of your species are very sensitive to herbicides, uh, millet being one of the primary ones. If you want to use a millet, uh, you know, you're going to have to go into a, basically a roundup system because a lot of these other herbicides it's very sensitive to and it won't grow very well in that type of deal. That's a really good point. Um, so we'll, we'll actually come to a little bit of that here coming up. Let's talk a little bit about cattle performance on the front end here. Just understand that brassica species are about, when they're up and green and growing, they're about 90% water, okay? So there's two rules to that deal. Don't stand behind the cow because it'll be an ugly mess. And then the second thing is you got to be realistic. When you're dealing with a, a, a plant that's 90% water, what type of animal performance you're going to get off of that. Not such a big deal in this country right here because we don't tend to graze a lot of calves post weaning. Uh, and it's not that big of a deal for cows because cows have the rumen volume to eat a lot of this stuff and it'll meet its nutritional needs. Calves obviously don't have that volume and so they don't tend to perform quite as well on, on just like a brassica monoculture. Okay? Uh, the cereal grains tend to be about 60 to 65 percent moisture at the boot stage, uh, which you know plus or minus is when you probably will harvest them. Or